Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, It's Time to Fix Cross-Border Payments. I'm Dominic Cobson, co-founder of Future of Finance, and I'm delighted to moderate our discussion this afternoon. Cross-border payments exact a continuous toll on economic activity. They eat somewhere between 1% and 3% of the national income of every country on Earth. Much of that cost is borne not by companies or by governments, but by consumers, and especially by consumers that send remittances to their families. Remittance charges average 6.82%. In addition, whereas a growing proportion of domestic payments settle instantly, a cross-border payment can take days. And by the time every intermediary has had a cut of that payment, as much as a tenth of the value of the payment can disappear. So it's not surprising that the United Nations has identified cross-border transaction costs as effectively a cause of poverty, or that the G20 has identified improving the efficiency of cross-border payments as a high priority. Its agent, the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, the CPMI, has now identified 19 building blocks to a better system and published a roadmap to get there. But a cynic, and after a lifetime in journalism, I have become a bit cynical, I'm afraid, a cynic could be forgiven for believing that a global industry generating revenues for its participants of somewhere between one and a half and two trillion dollars a year, and one looking forward, according to BCG, to another trillion a year by 2027, as international remittances and trade and capital flows increase, that interest group is going to fight hard to maintain the status quo, however indefensible it appears to be. Now, to help us assess the prospects for change, I'm joined by five people who, from their different vantage points, can see the scope for change and how it might be accomplished. Daniel Eden is an advisor and solution architect at the Bank for International Settlements Innovation Hub. Arjun Jairam is founder and CEO of Baton Systems, which facilitates automated asset movements across the post-trade process from trade matching through to settlement. Daniel Heller is the Head of Regulatory Affairs at Finality International. He joined after holding senior positions at the Swiss National Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, and the International Monetary Fund. Stephen Granger is Executive Vice President, New Payment Platforms at MasterCard. Bikesh Patel is Head of UK and Ireland at SWIFT. He was previously COO at LCH, which he joined after holding a variety of roles focused mainly on post-trade issues and market infrastructures at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. As always, in addition to our panelists, we have you, our audience, and all of us encourage everybody watching or listening to submit questions and comments throughout this webinar by using the functionality at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Rest assured, I will not be saving those questions up to the end, but I will be putting them to our panelists as we go along. So you as a member of the audience can be an integral part of this discussion right from the outset. I'd like to begin by asking what seems a pretty obvious question. SWIFT will be 45 years old next year. CLS is 20 years old. So we've had these infrastructures in place now for decades. Why aren't cross-border payments already as cheap as domestic payments? Am I being too cynical if I suggest that's because these infrastructures are, at the end of the day, the slaves of the banking industry, in particular of certain very large uh, and important global banks. After all, there are 25,000 banks in the world, but almost every cross-border payment passes through just 15 of those 25,000 banks. So are we dealing with a price-setting oligopoly, which market infrastructures such as SWIFT and CLS are powerless to oppose? Arjun, could I throw that question at you first? Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it, it, from the, from the outset, from looking out, you know, looking inside from the out, it, it, I can see your, your, your view and you're, you're, you're being skeptical of, of this. But we looked at this a little in, in, in a little more detail. If you think about a cross-border payment, effectively, these are payments in two local markets with an FX that is, that is stapled on the top of it. And when we looked at why payments are slow, why is it expensive, we found that there are some structural problems, uh, and I'll get to that. There are some market structural problems, and, and what you're seeing is, is, is a structural problem that's manifesting itself as cost, manifesting itself as delays. But there, there are some structural problems that are in, in markets. Um, and then there is also a technology problem. Let me talk about the market structure problem. The structure problem is central banking, as we know it today, restricts the number of people who can open accounts in central banks really giving only the largest banks, allowing them to open accounts in, in central banks and then maintain liquidity buffers. Essentially, these are the only banks that have the largest number of correspondent banking relationships. They are also the people who pre-fund their accounts in these, in these various locations. And essentially what you've created is a market structure that, that 
uh, forces itself to certain oligopolies that or certain large liquidity uh, centers in order to solve this particular problem. If you look, if you were to look at it one more in sort of, so within the market structure problem, there are what are called market makers. These are people who make the, the bid ask spread on both sides. And in, you're not done with that. That's only the FX trades. In order to settle the trades, you need to hold money. This is where the large liquidity centers are to be held. Liquidity is not cheap. You have to hold, like, there's a cost of liquidity. So essentially, when you think about this, there is a cost of liquidity, there is a cost of operations, and then there's the cost of the entire settlements. This is slow, this is expensive. What we figured out is that you can, you can get past this market structure problems, you can settle this on demand 24 hours a day. And what we have demonstrated here at the turn is that you can do this in under three minutes across the globe. You can do this in under three minutes, irrespective of the currency with settlement finality, and you can do this today. You don't have to wait for the perfect world to happen. You can do this today. That's, that's, my, that's my take on it. Thanks, Sergeant. I, I was, Danny, I was caught by one thing, which uh, arrested by one thing that um, Arjun said there, which is there are structural problems, and that includes limited access to, to central bank money. Now, I know Finality International has some uh, has developed a, a potential solution to that to widen the, the range of organizations that have access to central bank money. Could you address that question? Perhaps give us your thoughts uh, as well on top of that as to whether what do you think the real origin of this high cost, slow speed of cross-border payments actually is? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I, I fully agree with Archon that uh, access to, to central bank accounts is indeed a, an obstacle. And uh, because this means, you know, if you want to transfer money uh, in a foreign currency, you need to go through a correspondent bank in, in today's world. And that's pretty much the same mechanism as has been used uh, 150 years ago, right? There has been uh, no, no change in, in this type of intermediation. So at, at Finality, uh, we try to, to overcome this by uh, building various payment systems in the key currencies uh, where we provide access to, uh, to foreign banks to the extent that central banks allow us to do so. So, and put very simply, you know, the more foreign uh, bank participants you have in a payment system, uh, the less intermediation you have, the quicker you can uh, make uh, transfers and the easier it is to, to control the risks. So I do think uh, one of the keys to uh, improvements in, uh, in cross-border payments is wider access to, uh, to payment infrastructures. Dominic, can I just come in on that point, actually, just briefly? I, I think it's spot on what, what Arjun and Danny have said. But, you know, when St. John Cunliffe wrote in the foreword for the G20 report, um, he also said that, you know, it, we shouldn't necessarily expect that domestic, that cross-border payments should be as easy or as cheap as domestic ones. Um, and I think, that's a, I think that's a fair point, right? In, in truth, you know, what we're faced with is you've got one closed loop system where a payment's being originated out of. You've got typically another closed loop system that a payment's being sent into. And in the middle, that is that friction point, right? And so the report, the G20 report, quite rightly highlights a whole range of friction points that need to be resolved, whether that's by industry, whether that's by regulators, whether that's by groups coming together to help find a public-private partnership way forward on addressing those challenges. But, but solving the, the way to be able, those frictions to be able to break into those closed loop systems is the real challenge in that. And that, that implies a friction and that friction will be there for quite some time, irrespective, I think, of what the mechanism is of moving money into a particular market. I'm happy to, to jump in if, if Dominic, if you'll allow me. I was about to ask you because I'd, I'd like your opinions on um, on the, some of the papers which the BIS has put out, uh, which look forward to a world in which we have CBDCs, for example, and there, there are a variety of ways in which, if you like, the RTGS systems operated by the central banks might be hooked up um, to deal with some of those high levels of intermediation. And I mean, I heard what Stephen said about you can't expect it to be the same as a domestic payment. But, you know, if, if a remittance is costing 6.8 percent, the UN has said it wants that at least half. The UN, I think, or G20 said want 3 percent 
to be a target by 2030 or something. So the bank, the, the industry is not being asked to do the impossible. But anyway, g- give yeah. us your view on that. No, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, I, I agree with the kind of the, the sentiment in, uh, in amongst the panelists. And, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that people kind of generally think that the, the central bank access to central bank money is at the core of this. Uh, I think you're absolutely right about the, the that 6.38 or 6.8% number. It's actually interesting to trace back that number and try to kind of piece it together and see what it's where where it comes from and what's the basis for that analysis. Uh, it, it is probably important to say that that number is mostly in remittances and in low low vol- value payments. So that's kind of the high end of the spectrum, but that's not an excuse because even a number as low as 3% or as low as 1% when you're talking about wholesale large value payments, that's that's still a lot of money. You know, you can think about it at a 1% payment, you put $100 in on one end, $99 comes out on the other end over and over and over again. That's still something that, you know, is questionable if it's acceptable in the digital world of e-commerce and trade and capital flows that we live in today. So so by all, by all means, I definitely agree with that. And I think that this also shows that the sentiment of, of the BIS and the innovation hub that's working on, on, on in a way kind of enacting a lot of the G20 and the CPMI cross-border payment initiatives is 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 already fruitful and, and shows a strong promise. It's not just CBDC, um, it's not just CBDC initiatives, but it's also new financial market infrastructures and connecting existing systems as well, right? So we're definitely trying to tackle all angles uh, uh, of this Rubik's Cube. I think there's something really interesting, just uh, maybe I'll just kind of comment a little bit on, on, on the private public uh, stuff. I, I think that that's a really interesting um, component to this. And, you know, I definitely agree that cross-border payments will never be as simple as domestic ones. I think you have to take a historical context to, you know, what the world was like not, not that long ago um, when the volume of cross-border payments uh, simply didn't exist. The customer demand didn't exist, uh, whether it's e-commerce or trade or you know, any of those things, it, that, that just wasn't as, uh, as relevant as it is today. In addition to that, you know, we can't turn a blind eye to cryptocurrencies that ultimately operate in a permissionless borderless environment, putting pressure on market participants um, and market infrastructure to to up the game. I mean, it, it's it's really it's really that simple. And I think central banks, the community of central banks, and the community of of, of financial market infrastructure is is definitely responding. I think when we think about private, when we think about the forces here between private and public markets, I think it's just important to note that you know private participants will ultimately operate based on commercial incentives and and have brought solutions to bear that you know, have commercial value. Uh, if you look at correspondent banking and particularly the retreat of correspondent banking, it has a lot to do with, you know, commercially viable uh, regions. And then on the other hand, you know, public uh, market participants ultimately want f- stability within their jurisdiction, within their country, and that's inherently a domestic type structure. So I think going back to maybe the way where we started this with with the G20 and the CPMI cross-border initiative, I think what we're broadly seeing there is a, is a coordination um, and only through this coordination type mechanism will we ultimately kind of push down uh, those costs. And, uh, and I'll, I'll stop there. Before I let you go, you, you brought up the question that the shrinkage of the correspondent banking industry, and I'm, I'm going to ask Bikesh about this in a minute. But um, the problem seems to be the KYC, AML, CFT sanction screening risk. People don't want to take the risk on their customer's customer. And that's why they say they're withdrawing. So in effect, regulators have been regulating correspondent banking um, out of existence. Now, if that is the problem, there are some obvious solutions to it, like digital identities. Why isn't greater priority being given by the regulators, by the BIS, if you like, to, to solving that problem in an attempt to rescue the correspondent banking industry from disappearing altogether? Um, I don't know what greater what greater attention would look like. I think that you know the problem with digital identity is 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 very uh, you know apparent to us all. I think it's a it's a it's a problem that is much more complicated than payments. I think payment payments look simple compared to problems with digital identity. I do think that digital identity, although manifests itself primarily in the retail markets, uh, that's why working in wholesale markets is, is, is just simpler just because of the nature of, of the AML and CFT and, and, and things of that nature. Um, and there are regions um, like India in particular that's, that's doing an exceptionally good job at, uh, at implementing nationwide digital identities. And I think that that kind of manifests itself also in the, in the payment market. So I think a lot of attention is being paid to this, but it's a it's a slow, multifaceted problem to solve. Uh, Bikesh, could I could I bring you in? I, I made a slightly un, un, unkind remark at the outset about these twenty five thousand banks, most of which are 
are not really doing cross-border payments at all, but relying on these, these large global banks. A lot of those 25,000 banks are going to be your members. Uh, we've just talked about correspondent banking. It's still the case that, that the average cross-border payment still has 2.6 correspondent banks uh, involved in it. Uh, we've talked about um, central banks playing a, a bigger part in this and, and perhaps played some part in, in creating the problem in the first place. But could central banks uh, do the FX component as well? Give us, give us your thoughts, um, Bikesh, on the, on the, if you like, on, on, on the role of correspondent banking in, in creating and, and in solving this problem, particularly in collaboration, if you like, with, with the central banks. So, yeah, no, thanks, Dominic. And actually, you know, it would be remiss of me not to kind of uh, talk about the opening comment. And really, you know, I think looking at it from Swiss perspective, we have for over 40 years sought to bring common solutions to common challenges. And that continues to be the way we work. And we work with the ecosystem. We work with partners. And we do so in a way that's, you know, based on trust, resiliency, security and innovation. And actually, the work of my IOSCO group, I think, has been well thought through, well presented, and well articulated. And one of the things that perhaps is um, worth reflecting on is that there is an interplay of all of the issues. I mean, if, if, if it was a simple issue to be resolved and a one-dimensional problem, like you hypothesized, it would have been solved before. And actually, it can be quite easy to go into speed, transparency, and fees, all of which are important, but there's been meaningful progress based on the industry's investment in those areas. And we have stats show, you know, well over 40% of payments, cross-border payments are credited to the end beneficiary in five minutes. You know, you know, speed is definitely being looked at. And actually, when you look at some of the frictions, and I like the way Stephen presented it, which is very much in line with our strategy about being instant and frictionless account to account anywhere in the world, um, we have to look at some of the more some other sources of frictions that maybe weren't commented on, you know, things such as operating hours, where especially if you go against the sun, so if you go um, east, the receiving country is likely to be closed and therefore payments are going to be held up. If you look at the domestic leg and the market infrastructures and the domestic market where the payments are um, uh, ending, chances are there may be batch processing or a move from batch to legacy. And we've seen a number of RTGSs invest in this over the, the last few years and will continue to do so. And also local currency controls. And I'm not going to make any comments on the validity of those controls, but those controls do add friction. So it is the totality of friction that we need to look at not necessarily one dimension, um, because I, as, as I said, I don't think that's necessarily the way to kind of, kind of um, address the problem. I think turning to kind of what you were talking around in terms of correspondent banking and how the industry is responding, I think when we look at solutions and areas that the industry is working on, whether it's pre-validation, so looking at sources of friction before payments are initiated, whether we look at case resolution and where some of those processes could be improved, whether we look at initiatives that actually link up domestic MIs, and the UK is a great market that Swift went live with GP Instant a couple of years ago. These are great sources of innovation that, that when come together, do help make meaningful ways forward. Um, th thank you. Um, thank you, Vikesh. That's, could I ask you just bef before I, before I get, get Stephen and, and Danny's views on this, could I ask you whether the customers are part of the problem here, that the corporates, the governments, I mean, the consumers are, are, are virtually powerless, but they are in the end the people who end up paying this because the fees get charged to the merchants who then pass them on in, in higher prices to the, to the consumers. So all this net interest margin, all these liquidity costs, uh, which Arjun mentioned at the outset, these FX spreads and so on, in the end show up in prices to, to consumers. Is transparency into the data, what's actually going on, who's eating what in this value chain, part of the answer to this problem? And if so, what's Swift doing about that? So, yeah, and I think it's hard to argue that transparency does not allow people and organizations, corporates, SMEs to make better decisions. And that's certainly in line with our strategy when we look at the data that GPI and our future evolution of our strategy will provide. The other thing I would say is that you know, talking to corporates and SMEs, they're interested in choice and the, and the experience they get. 
You know, those who are uh, transacting cross border usually are multi banked. So actually, they're looking for the experience. They're working with their providers, and there's tooling that they they feel they get that. But actually, they're doing you know they're transacting business. They're taking part in global trade, and actually, they want the payments to keep up with the pace at which goods and services are now being able to be transacted, albeit petrol in the UK at the moment. Um, but you know, that being said, you know, if people have a choice of an RTGS and an instant scheme and a choice to be able to use both, as we're beginning to see in the UK, that's a great corporate experience where they no longer have to be driven by cutoff times uh, and things of that order. So I would say, yes, transport is important, but it's important, the, the experience is important, and that choice insofar as it gives them um, opportunity. Thanks, Vikesh. We're losing you there a bit, so um, do have a look at your at your microphone. Um, can, I'm gonna... I, can I make one statement about what that was? Uh, if yes, you, Arjun, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So you, you know, you asked about about transparency, and you also asked about central banking trying to get in the middle of of, an, of making an FX trade. Um, if you look at it from first principles, the central bank uh, an FX trade involves two things. One, it involves uh, actually making a bid ask spread. That is actually making a bid ask spread, which is basically taking risk in that. And the second part of it is actually there is a settlement risk. So there is a there is a you you have you have to provide credit, and there's a risk element in that, and then there's there are, there are, there's a liquidity element in that. Central banks are not take are not in the business of taking risk and not issuing credit. Hmm. Uh, so so they they cannot be by definition they cannot be market makers in that. So you have to allow people who have access to central banking make the be the market makers in that. Again, coming back to my first point you have a structural problem. And the structural problem is you do not give enough people access to central banking. And therefore you've created this oligopoly where only certain market makers are limited. And the moment you have market makers that, are, that, that, have, this, that have the structural problem, then you introduce, then there is no incentive for them to be transparent in that. Because if I'm a market maker, I would try to maximize my, my bid ask spread on that because there's no need for me to, meet, for me to be transparent. You also brought about the question about 26,000 people. Yes, there are 26,000 members who need access to this, this infrastructure. Imagine if you provided them all access to that infrastructure, transparency will increase, your bid ask spreads are gonna be so tight, and so you're gonna naturally bring down the prices. That's my view on this. Uh, you want efficiencies, you need to remove these, these, these structural problems. But the way we have looked at this particular one is that you are able to solve this problem today. You don't have to wait for the perfect world five years from now, but you can solve this problem today. And with a little bit of changes, you'll be able to solve the problem. That's that's my view. Mm -hmm. Just summarize for us what that solution yeah. is today. Yes. So we get so it solution, very clear in our minds. The, the solution for that is, you know, solve this problem of market structure. And the structure is to basically say, can I provide a way for these 26,000 to 30,000 members, including corporates, access to settling a trade at a venue? So I can do a bilateral settlements at a venue with settlement finality, with complete transparency, where and, and I have liquidity just on demand. So, so that the, the wider you mean wider access to central bank money. So you you don't need central bank money. So you I don't expect banks to change. You need regulatory. You need legislative changes in those things. Those will require regular legislative changes. I'm saying that you basically there is a structure that exists in large capitalized bank. Mm -hmm. Allow all of them to open an account in these large capitalized bank. Not one, but many within within a jurisdiction. But once you do that, you can connect them 24 hours a day and I can do settlements, inter PVP settlements between currencies in under three minutes. Mm -hmm. well, well, let me add to this, if I may. Yes. You know, I think it's useful to, to, uh, separ to uh, disentangle a cross-border payment, right? There's one component that is a uh, cross-currency cross -currency component. And the other one is just a non-cross-currency component, just a normal payment, right? I think the biggest frictions today we have in the, in the cross-currency settlement, right? As Arjun said, you know, we, we have to trade currencies. The, some currencies may be illiquid. Uh, so this leads to a bit ask spread. Then we have an issue of how we settle them. Can we do payment versus payment? I think there we have very limited options. As you mentioned, Dominic, we have CLS, but there's not much uh, else out there. So we need improvements there, right? How we trade FX and how we settle on a PVP basis. 
then once we have uh, made progress there, the next question is how do we actually move the foreign, foreign currency from the payer to the payee, right? And I think there, this today's system is much better than, than the one we have for the cross-currency pound. So I think we really have to, to look at this from all angles, right? And there's no single measure that, that fixes all of this. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask um, Daniel to give us a view on whether central banks want to get involved in the FX business, because I think I did read in, a, in one BIS report that uh, I think it was 11 central banks had expressed interest in getting involved. That's not like all central banks don't want to get involved in that. I'm not sure which countries they were from, but clearly there is some sort of appetite there to, to do that. And I'd also be interested in your views on, on widening access to, to central bank money, um, what, what Finality is doing. What it is. But before you answer that, I'd, I'd like to bring Stephen in and just ask him for a view. Um, one of the points Vikesh made um, very articulately was, was this difficulty of, of, of linking legacy technologies, infrastructures, you know, you've got batch processing, you've got limited operating hours, you know, is, is the solution here, and this is somewhere in the, in the, in the, um, in the CPMI report, is why don't we just extend the operating hours of these payment infrastructures, make them 24-7, 365. We're in a system where, you know, the CLS uh, is kind of, there's one hour, I think, where, where it's open for all the currency pairs to, to get the job done. Um, and that as, um, as, uh, as Arjun was pointing out, it forces these banks to maintain huge quantities of expensive liquidity just to, to cram everything into that hour. So what about just, are there, are there easy fixes which are purely technological and infrastructural here, which, which for whatever reason we haven't adopted? Stephen? Yeah, look, I, I, think, look, I think first I'm going to come back to Arjun's point it, it, to, to contextualise that. I think that the private sector, yes, they may be motivated by, by driving commercial outcomes, but the commercial sector has done an awful lot to drive change into, into this space, and not just the payment space, but cross-border space more broadly. Those frictional points, there, there are certain frictional challenges that actually are beyond the private sector to meaningfully be able to solve for. Whether it's you know the hours under which um, local clearing systems operate, you know, the decision to move to real-time payments is not one that is. The, you know, private, the private sector, and you know, I think about Vocalink within Mastercard. You know, they can they play a foundational role in helping to enable real time payment capabilities. But the decision is a national decision, and it is it is one that's usually driven by a a regulator or a governance authority to to drive that change. Um, but it's in that it's those frictions. You know, whether it's around sanction screening, whether it's around AML, whether it's around KYC actually normalizing that. So actually in those areas, what, what you often don't, what you often find is it's not a race to the bottom. It's a race to the top to have the most conservative policy. And so I think what, you know, that's, they're not easy to fix, but they are, they are things that we would look to regulators and regulatory bodies to help solve for. I think what you can then do is bring those together under a different way of operating. So I come back to Arjun's point. Um, if you want to scale an outcome that can support 25,000 banks and they can do it in a way that, and, and everybody can operate in a way that is that is drives known outcomes um, with predictability and with certainty, what that argues is moving towards a scheme type structure where it's a rules-based a rules-based outcome where everybody knows the rules of playing in that game, what it means to to send a payment in, what it means to process a payment, what it means to terminate a payment across a local rail. If that's the place we want to get to, then, then I think we're aligned with the view that's come out from you know, the BIS Innovation Hub that something like a scheme structure is, is worthy of consideration. And I think that's an area where MasterCard could play, a, could play a very compelling role in terms of driving that kind of structure forward. Daniel? Did you did you want to pick up the point I made earlier, but also maybe follow up what Stephen was saying there that, that there is a role for, for the BIS to take a, you know to take the lead here? Yeah, no, I absolutely, and I, and I agree with what Steve's saying. I'll try, I'll try to add with it, add to it because I think it was articulated exceptionally well. Um, I, I I agree very much. I think that the you know enabling twenty five thousand banks 
uh, equal access and an equal kind of schema to, to act upon is it ultimately falls to, you know, to governments, to legislation, to policymakers, and, and to be implemented by central banks. So I think that that's something that, you know, we're, we're definitely paying close attention to and thinking about a lot. Um, you know, things like access time, uh, AML, KYC, all of these things, I, I would just encourage a perspective that, you know, you really have to look at, at, at these things in context to the to to the time and the innovation in payments. I think now that we're seeing different technology, it also it enables different conversations around what it is to uh, apply AML and KYC and certain sanctions and certain operating hours and things like you know overnight rates and and all all of all, all of the all of the derivatives that kind of come out of that. Um, Maybe, you know, you asked me something very specific to, to begin with. You asked me, you know, will central banks ultimately get into, you know, the, the effects markets? And, and I, you know, I can't speak on behalf of all central banks. I can, I can speak, of, you know, broadly about kind of the sentiment that I see within the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it's, it's definitely understood that, you know, sitting at the bottom of these effects markets it is, you know, access to central bank funds. And I think that, you know, the central bank is trying to, central banks are trying to look at this and see whether or not it would be able, you would be able to create a more level playing field with more data transparency um, to, you know, enable more liquidity um, with, within different currency regions and more competitive, um, more competitive spreads uh, in FX markets and more liquidity. Um, you, you know, this is a timely conversation. We just released a, a report that was, uh, that's called the M's, the multiple CBDC bridge. And it's a joint project that's a continuation between the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the Central Bank of Thailand. And recently, recent joiners in the project were the People's Bank of China and the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at exactly these things. And, and you, you can check out the report it was issued today. And one of the, one of the things we, we paid particularly close attention to was enabling uh, payment versus payment bilaterally with, with currency pairs and enabling new mechanisms for FX quotes. And actually, if you scroll to the back, if you make it to the back of the paper and you scroll all the way to the very end, you'll see three distinct different implementations of different FX matching schemas. And I would attach that directly to the conversation around data, transparency, and, and, and the like. The other part of the conversation, and I heard mentioned you know, many times, is settlement. And it's ultimately also about access to settlement. And I, I would just want to maybe suggest that when we think about central bank digital currencies, one, one kind of interesting tangent of that is, is to realize that that takes the settlement from being something that is, you know, um, to, to, a, to a large degree kind of centralized and maybe puts the settlement in a, in a, in a, in a, in a peer to peer type fashion. And you have to kind of wonder what access to settlement will look like in a world of, of potentially bearer central bank liabilities between these type of institutions. So I, I think that the needle is definitely moving on, 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 on all those things. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear our work is in the, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, Daniel, I'm glad you brought up that question of, of the linkages between these CBDC based payment market infrastructures, if you like. And, and I'd like to come back to that because I want to talk about the solutions to this problem, which are now in the offing. And that's definitely one of them. Just before I do, I'd like to ask um, Vikesh, um, you heard Stephen bring up the question of, you know, the commercial sector is, you know, is making progress here, but there's limits to what it can actually do. Now, there's been no shortage of fintechs operating in the, in the payment space. Um, and I, to be honest, I've become a bit cynical about them. Uh, I'm cynical about many things, as you as you can probably recognize, but I, it seems to me a lot of these fintechs actually have, haven't really changed anything fundamental. They basically creamed off a lot of revenue from the banks, which didn't respond in a very competitive fashion to what they were doing, but they left all the risk with the banks. They're still operating on the same old payment uh, rails, which everybody's been using, whether they're Spiber credit card companies, RTGS systems, or ACHs, whatever they are. They seem to have changed nothing, but have made a small number of people very wealthy. Am I... Am I right to think that actually the fintechs are not part of the solution to this problem? They're just one of the ways in which an inefficiency is being exploited. So what I would say about fintech is, is really just taking it to the point around innovation and how kind of creative forces can come together to solve problems. Now, I still think that there's a lot of progress in that front. What I think we also need to look at, and we've touched on in this conversation, is um, operating in um, highly related 
uh, environments with consumer protection regulations, with relationships that are there that have to be maintained. You know, there has to be a coming together and a partnership between both, both established participants and actors and those who can bring to scale new solutions. And actually, the point that Stephen made in, um, earlier is a good one. You know, solutions need to be scalable. So actually, that, that, that needs to be thought about as well. So I'm more optimistic about, you know, the, the role that fintechs have played and will play. I think open ecosystems and the ability to connect and think about how people uh, need to and, and, and organizations can enrich each other's offerings and bring new consumer offerings to the market is, is going to be important and will continue to stay important. So, yeah, more definitely more bullish on the role that can be played here. Mm -hmm. oh, wait, can, I just, can I just add on to that yeah. actually just just one thing very briefly and that, that is you know when this G, when the G20 report came out you know it, it was it was prefaced with a lot of discussion around the fact that actually you know of these 19 points that were that were incorporated within the report the last two focused on the cool stuff if you like it was the you know how do you introduce differentiated types of technology driven platforms that could upend the way we think about cross-border payments. Mm. But it was also there was also a lot of discussion in the papers and in and, and in conversations around the side that actually to get to that point you still needed to solve for those 17 other friction points around the edge that by themselves don't just magically go away. So I think what we can prove is you know that there are, without doubt, better ways, better frictionless ways of being able to solve for, for cross-border payments. But, but the reality is the vast majority of money is still going to move across very many of the same rails that it moves across today. It's still going to move across correspondent banking-like channels. Um, it's still going to remove move through remittance providers. So how do you then solve... So how do you solve some of the real challenges? And I do think that you're going to come on to solutions. A big part of this, we focused a lot about the wholesale story, but really there is a, you know, when we go back to that remittance story, there is a financial, financial literacy challenge. There is a perception around the need to hold cash, you know, a, a, a non-digitized domestic operating markets. If we could find ways to move, you know, Panacea mode, all domestic markets to real time to real time platforms. Then, and you enable you look, you look at what's happened in places like Thailand, where they when when they've introduced real time payments, the amount of enablement that has driven within the country to change and upend the way that people hold money, receive money, and pay money away is it is astounding. So. If you can drive change, that's why I come back to these closed loop systems. If you can make these closed loop systems better, more effective, it doesn't need to be about accessing RTGS per se, but it is about the fundamentals that hang around enabling a real time payment infrastructure. You could fundamentally change the way that people hold money, disperse money, think about money, remit money as a beneficiary and as a, and as a sender. And I think that is, um, I think that that for me feels like a, a very core component of how we think about the future. Otherwise, we're operating in this middle layer somewhere. We're trying to intermediate between the frictions because they may be too difficult to solve for. And that doesn't feel like a really compelling place to end up. OK, you're, you're basically saying instant real-time payment kind of drives the whole new ways of thinking. I mean, I, I, drive. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was a bit depressed when I read the G20 report, those 17 items you refer to. There's a lot of stuff in there about common vision and common roles and guidelines and data frameworks and data sharing, common technical approach. And so on, all of which sounds like it involves an awful lot of people around an awful lot of tables getting nowhere for a very long period of time. And it's just those, those two concrete measures are the only thing which, which will actually lead to change. But we're, we're into our last sort of 20 minutes or so, and we're starting to get some, some comments from the audience, which I think is, are interesting. If um, 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 Mitkoff says, wow, all the speakers are shockingly out of date. Has anyone looked at DeFi protocols? Um, uh, uh, somebody else says, uh, oh, Makoto, um, can't read the name for some reason. Uh, they're not considering private or supranational currencies. So let, let's let's jump jump straight into that. Um, you know, what if we move to a to a blockchain style world of of um, highly conditional or atomic uh, settlement um, in commercial bank money? I guess to, to start with, um, is that 
is that a is that a viable situation? What have we got to learn from the from the world of DeFi? Now, Arjun, you, you, you're if you yeah, like a fintech yeah. in this area. What's your what's your reaction to these comments we're getting that we're all shockingly out of date, sure, and sure. we should be looking at what DeFi has done to change the world? Uh, just just to you know, we we look at ourselves. You know, Baton looks at ourselves as we look at ourselves as as a DeFi solution. Uh, which is basically, if you think about it from first principles, this is just a lot of FUD factor in this in this blockchain world. That's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so if you distill all that FUD factor and you get down to first principles, which is how I like to think about it. In a DeFi world, you have each person operates a node and you have a trade that you're going to settle bilaterally with another person or a transaction that you're going to settle in bilaterally with another person. That's the objective that you, you, you want to get to. And you want to do this in the most transparent way, in the most efficient way, in the, in the fastest and the cheapest possible way. If Janie's point is, do you want to do this in the most direct way? Do you need a central bank? Do you need a bank? Do you need a vendor in the way? Why don't you just do it, you know, peer to peer across yep. the DeFi protocol? So again, if you, if you cut out all the, all the fun, and then you get down to the reality of that. The way to do that in the, in the, in the, in the blockchain way is that you pre-fund it. Essentially, you hold stable coins and you exchange tokens. All that sounds hunky-dory, Till you come to the point, why do you where do you get the stable coin to start with? Well, you purchase a stable coin, which means that I have to lock up liquidity to start with in order to solve this particular problem. So you're back to the same old world that that you had, which is which is the oligopoly of holding holding you know tying up liquidity to solve this particular problem. Which is why most of these stable coins and and the, and, a, and a pre-funded models don't really won't see the light of day. In in that's my my personal opinion. You need, what you need is just in time funding in a much faster, cheaper way. And for that, you can take the principles of DeFi, but you enable the banks to be more efficient in order to, to facilitate that settlements. That's my view on, on this particular topic. All right. So Daniel, give us a, I mean, the, the CPMI, you know, one of its recommendations was we look at, you know, privately issued stable coins as part of this answer, as well as, as, well as tokenized fiat currency or CBDCs. I mean, are they, yeah. Has Libra DM sunk the whole stablecoin thing in, in, in payments forever, or is this still part of potential part of the solution? Um, I, I, I think it potentially still is part of the solution. I, I, you know, I think you know I, a big part of my job is is looking at crypto and DeFi protocols and trying to understand trying to understand them well enough to to bring them into the institutional and central banking community. So so maybe I'll start this off by saying you know all of the moving fast and breaking things is happening in the DeFi community. And, and you know, it's arguable that a lot of the, the that DeFi has done more to put pressure on, on, on banks and on central banks and on the, on, and on fintechs to, to, to act now quickly um, and has put pressure on that maybe exi didn't exist for, for a long time. And that in itself is, is a very kind of com commendable uh, thing to do. Um, with that said though, I think that the, the, the environment where you can operate fast and break things and and iterate endlessly uh, with basically no consequences to almost anything is is just not how um, you know institutions operate. It's not how national central bank operates, and and it's not really how anybody in this room um, does does business. And and I think for for the DeFi supporters out there that think that it's as easy as you know, sending value is as easy as sending a text message. You know, in theory, um, they're right when they talk about you know sending a couple hundred dollars uh, with a certain amount of volatility in the price and uh, completely no guarantees around uh, around settlement. But back to what Arjun said, I mean, at the end of the day, the question is, what is the liability that you're moving? What is the value that you're moving? What, and not how it behaves on the best days, but how it behaves. On the worst days, and I think that at the end of the day, you know, an institutional perspective is 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 one that you know you you really have to brace for the worst, and it's at those those critical moments. You know, central central banks are, are often seen as 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 you know institutions that move slowly, and that and and that's for good reason. It's because it has to work at the worst of times, um, and and that's something that I think the DeFi community doesn't uh, has an underappreciation for. Uh, but, like, but like I said, there's a lot of good protocols there, and I think that I think that uh, the the entire community has a lot to learn from some of the experiments that are going on in, in the DeFi world. And, and I would add to this, if I may, I think DeFi really has potential in the way that we don't need banks to transfer value, right? But I think uh, the test will really be how DeFi can operate in a fully regulated environment. 
Yeah, I see, right? It's payment systems law, and I see it every day. I mean, it's a lot of work, right? A lot of the friction comes from regulatory requirements. And that's good like this, right? It's a big difference between just having some something that works from a technological point of view to really having something in a life environment that is compliant with global uh, financial law, right? That's really a big difference. But I think the DeFi people would simply say the, the, the law is out of date. We've got, you know, Jamie saying here, DeFi protocols don't want to put pressure on banks, they want to remove banks completely out of the picture. Now, I have a specific question for you, Danny, which is about that in the DeFi world, everyone's always fully funded. Nobody's trading anything on credit. Nobody's borrowing money. Everybody's liquid at the right at the right time. Now that's not the way the system has worked, as as um, uh, Arjun pointed out right at the start of this discussion. You know, liquidity costs are enormous to to these banks because they don't always have the moolah to settle the the transactions for which they are which they are liable. Um, but we're also being told here by Makoto Takemaya that actually the DeFi model can allow people to join in and provide liquidity through this automated market making. They kind of crowdsource. Uh, liquidity when you need it. And in DeFi, we are seeing, you know, credit models. Uh, people are lending their cryptocurrencies to people who are short of that cryptocurrency. And those pairs are being traded against, against stable coins. So there is something in there which we as um, as people involved in the, in the international banking industry, international payments industry, should be at least looking at and seeing, is there something in that experiment? Irrespective of what the law says and how we've done things in the past, is this something we should be learning from? Look, I mean, I have had arguments with the regulators in the sense that I said, you really have to take a functional approach. You know, if you use DeFi to lend, then use the rules that are applied everywhere to lending, right? It's don't get sidetracked by the technology or anything, right? It's really, it has to be a level playing field across all activities in terms of the regulation. And if DeFi is better, then it should win. You know, it's very simple, but the same rules have to apply. Yeah. Well, if Jenny thinks the regulatory model is set up to protect the bank's criminal monopoly, so I think we know where he's coming from. It's not so bad. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, you want to protect uh, investors, you know, you want to protect consumers, you don't want money laundering. I mean, these are good values, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can well, Phil Mocken, who comes from a from a, a fintech background as well, says liquidity has to be centralized to be effectively provisioned, and DeFi is the antithesis of this. So that that argument will go on. I think we'll, we'll be talking about this for many years to come, at, or many months to come, at least at, at Future of Finance. But before I, I know I wanna, Martin's dying to join just, in, uh, uh, Daniel. But before you do, just could you? I just want to make one. Dis- I just want to ask Danny, just, I very want to hear much here from you, Daniel, but I just want to ask Danny one question very quickly. Could you just explain to us very quickly what the finality solution, these central bank omnibus accounts is? Can you explain very briefly and very clearly to our audience what the solution is? Okay, let me try. <laughs> so it, coming back to regulation, if you are in the wholesale space, meaning payments between banks, right, large values, hundreds of millions, then what is important is that you regulation requires you to have a, a safe settlement asset. And the most straightforward way to achieve this is to do it in, in a central bank account, right? But since we are a private sector system, we need something that is very close to a central bank account. So what we do is we pre-fund all of our settlement balances through an account we have at the various central banks. And then we use these balances in our ledger to make payments. So every dollar or pound sterling we have in the finality payment system is at all times fully backed by central bank money. So this makes it very safe, almost as safe as central bank money. So that's that's one way of solving uh, risk uh, in in a settlement asset in large value payments. Can I get a chance to explain the counter to that? Well, just before you do, Arjun, I, I held up Daniel. I'd like to, he yeah. wanted to say something, but then we'll come to you after that. But Daniel, what did you want to say? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, Arjun, go ahead, go ahead. No, I think, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good point of view that, that uh, Dan is, is talking about. Uh, you know, that the, the view is that you open an account at a central bank and then you, you pre-fund that. 
The important thing is that you open it at a central bank, which limits the number of people who can participate to start with. The second one is you pre-fund it. The counter to that is to say, look, um, how do you allow these 26,000 or 30,000 people to open accounts in the various locations that they need to, in the various currencies that they, that they need to? And the answer is that you look at market structures which have solved that particular problem, which are large, well-capitalized, highly liquid settlement banks. So you don't need a, you, you don't need a proliferation of, of correspondent banks, but you pick very large banks within a currency without a concentration risk. You allow them all to operate and open an account in that particular bank. Once you do that, these become settlement participants that can now do a bilateral settlements between each other with settlement finality. So essentially you bring liquidity just to the point in time on demand, you don't wait for the end of the day, you bring it just in demand and you settle bilateral with settlement finality 24 hours a day. And the in, commercial bank, in commercial bank money. In commercial bank money. Now, now let me, let me. Uh, I, I know this is a solution you are offering as Baton, right? No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, see, this is the thing that you, the fallacy is that CLS settles in central bank money, okay? The fallacy is that it settles in central bank. Yes, it settles in central bank money for one hour, one hour. During that one hour, there is money moving in central bank. But before you started the settlement, you had funds in, in, in an Austro account. And after the settlement happened, you had funds in a settlement account. So all you did is, is during this process of one hour, you moved this around in central bank, and then you effectively ended up with, with a commercial bank exposure before and after. Why go through all of this and you can settle 24 hours a day on demand with settlement finality when you have it? But I think, I think, the, I think the CLS users would say they benefit greatly from the netting of those payments before they oh, get we do the that netting can be done. Netting can be done anytime you want. Instead of doing it once a day, at the end of the day, do it on demand. On demand. Okay. Um, uh, Vikesh, um, I don't know to what extent this is, this is the other the solution which, which Daniel has, has, has raised, uh, not, not in its complete, fully articulated form, but these papers published by the BIS. In other words, we would end up with linkages between CBDC-based payment market infrastructures. This is talked about in, in the CPMI, the, the 20, the 19 building blocks. I think it is the 19th of the, of the building blocks. Um, as Daniel pointed out, it's being tested by central banks in Hong Kong and Thailand and the UAE. And uh, I think China was involved at, at, at one stage as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and now incorporating a, a cross-border component in a CBDC is, is, is not, not, everyone's thinking about this domestically. I think the BIS survey said only like 11 central banks are actually thinking about a cross-border component, but clearly um, this would, if this could be made to work, whether or not central banks do the FX piece, which is stable on top of the payments would be a revolution. In, in cross-border settlement. In fact, would, would represent, I guess, Vikesh, a problem for, 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 for SWIFT in, in servicing uh, correspondent banks, but maybe not, maybe I misunderstood it. But what's your reaction to that idea as a, a long-term solution to this problem of the cost and slow speed of cross-border payments? Yeah, and um, you know, I think as we said earlier, you know, I think um, we need to be careful when we say cross-border payments are slow. Um, you know, we've got we've got data on that, right? And as I said, I think it's more nuanced than that, right? It's more nuanced than just saying it's slow. Um, on CBDCs, you know, there's this whole um, monetary policy de um, determination that needs to be made. Now, from a SWIFT perspective. Um, we, we think that actually structured data, if it's a established form of transferring value, that the, the platform will be able to support that. So, uh, you know, we, we, we stand ready. We're talking to a number of central banks about this. We're talking to the BIS and actually, you know, spending, spending a lot of time thinking around actually, you know, how does our strategy play into that as well? And I fear I may have lost you because I think the screen I'm looking at is frozen. Oh, we can hear you fine. Carry on. Okay. Yeah. So no, I was just saying that. Um, yeah. You know, as a as a form of transferable value, you know, we absolutely think that you know, that, uh, so long as you know the the areas that the central banks are looking at in terms of monetary policy and various other kind of money supply issues that need to be looked at, the reasons why they're bringing CBDCs in. You know, we, we published a white paper on this recently. You know, we think actually the, plat the SWIFT platform can play a role in transmitting and allowing those data attributes to, 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 to coexist as well. 
Uh, thanks, Vikesh. Uh, uh, Daniel, talk us through, um, we're down to our, heading for our last five minutes here, but talk us through this CBDC-based payments uh, um, link-ups, which you, which you touched on earlier, um, because I think it could be the change which alters the way in which cross-border payments are, are made, irrespective, as I say, of whether central banks get involved in the FX component. Yeah, happily, and, and maybe maybe I'll take a slightly more technical angle because uh, th that that at the end of the day is my expertise, and and, uh -huh. I, and I'll leave kind of the, the policy and the governance uh, maybe maybe to, to people that understand that or, or specialize in that a little bit more. Th there's a wonderful paper that was released in, in March this year, uh, and part of the paper was called "Multi CBDC Arrangements and the Future of Cross Border Payments." And in that paper, um, they 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 lay out three distinct models of of what these CBDC arrangements can look like. Um, model one has more to do with traditional infrastructure and CBDCs riding on top of traditional infrastructure, but models two and three are particularly interesting. And in models two and three, they talk about either regional or, or kind of jurisdictional um, central bank digital currency components and a connectivity between them that has you know, interoperability protocols between them. So what that would look like, for example, if we take um, Hong Kong and Thailand, as an example, would be that you would have a domestic arrangement in Hong Kong, you would have a domestic arrangement in Thailand, and then you would have some type of interoperability protocol that sits in between these domestic, domestic arrangements. Model three, uh, as an alternative to that, is a suggestion that maybe you could have a kind of a um, uh, a kind of global clearing and settlement mechanism uh, for all of these CBDC platforms. Now, you know, I, I think we're starting from kind of a very coarse distinction between those two things. I think it will likely, you know, we're probably going to converge to, you know, model 2.5 and then slowly split it up to, to more and more granular components. Uh, but, but I think by and large, you know, the, the, the allure of, of CBDC, uh, you know, and maybe in a sense, it's also a little bit of the, of, of the allure of DeFi is really looking at the problem from a very different perspective all of a sudden. Um, if you introduce a central bank digital currency, you're introducing a liability of a central bank in a digital form that has, you know, a, a different type of access model, maybe an access model that even scales much better than the current, uh, the current RTGS systems. Um, and, and, and with this different model, um, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're able to, to conceive um, of cross-border value transfer in a way that, you know, maybe today is, is, is a lot more patchwork um, and has more of a distinction between kind of the payment messages and settlement cycles um, and opening hours and, you know, all, all of the things that we've been discussing. So I, I think it's, I think, you know, it, it, for, for anybody on the panel that kind of wants to catch up I and mean, we've referenced the G20 CPMI work a lot. I think this paper on multi-CBDC arrangements and cross-border payments uh, is, is a riveting one, uh, at least, at least for me. And if, and if you read that, I think you can, you can see a lot of where the innovation hubs work is happening. And I should also say that it's not just happening in Hong Kong, uh, it's happening regionally. And, and the vision really is that all these regions will link up. So there's a project that's happening in Hong Kong that we've mentioned a lot. There's a project happening in Singapore, between Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, and South Africa. There's a project happening in Europe uh, that's happening with the Swiss Innovation Hub, uh, that's happening between the SMB and the Banque de France. Um, and, and, and these things are slowly uh, um, popping up everywhere. And you know, we, we will start working on how these, how these uh, link together, but most importantly, also what use cases are used for. You know, we've talked about everything from remittances all the way to things that connect, talk more about capital markets and trade. And I think what's interesting here, it's not a payment is a payment. There's no one size fits all. This is an intricated, um, complicated problem, and there will be different modes and mechanisms to solve different problems, right? On the one hand, we have the liquidity uh, and the instant payments, um, you know, on, on the remittances. And on the other hand, we have settlement risk and effect spreads on, on the large value. So, you know, we're talking about a whole bunch of problems and I would encourage uh, uh, um, as much as possible to have a, um, a granular discourse um, and to really understand what the users want in the end. Well, uh, the link to that paper has been, has been shared. Can I, uh, we're running out of time now, but I'd just like to put one very blunt question to you, Daniel. What, ha if, if the CBDC, Multi CBDC model takes off. Are SWIFT and CLS relevant in, if that model is in place? Do they remain relevant? I, I think I'm the wrong person to be asking. Um, I, I think absolutely, though. I, I, I think, you know. I, I'll speak for, for, for myself and, and, and for the central banking community and for the bank and for the BIS. Everybody's forced to some degree to kind of 
re reinvent their, their products and their services and their offerings in the market. I mean, we like to think of the playing field as static and it's a zero sum game between, you know, CLS and SWIFT and central banking or DeFi or crypto or Bitcoin. And the reality is that the goalposts are moving. Uh, mm -hmm. The game is changing. Um, and, and I think we're all forced to, to react to, to the market. Um, uh, and from SWIFT to CLS to commercial banks to fintechs, uh, everybody is is everybody is 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 positioning themselves as best they can for the future, and and uh, I I don't think it's a zero sum game. I think everybody will play a role. Okay, I'd like to wrap this up just by asking everyone a question, asking the same question. Before I do, I just like to, to we like to to show all the things which are which our audience have asked. Phil Mocken has asked to what extent is the increasingly robust compliance environment leading to a loss of cross relationships? Is that the primary cause? I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, Vikesh, we discussed it earlier, didn't we? Um, when we touched on digital identities as possibly arresting that that decline. Um, uh, Phil also asked about the cost of tying up liquidity and finan finality settlement currency, and uh, Danny points out it's the same as holding central bank funds, so he's dealt with that. Um, uh, uh, Makoto says CBDCs are good for solving the last mile problem to deliver money to the retail users. Good point. Uh, you can send that to people's phones. Um, and that addresses Phil Mocken's other point, what problems are CBDC solving that needs solving? Well, there's one, financial inclusion it solves. Um, uh, although Makoto points out that depends on the CBDC models employed, you know, it could be retail, could be wholesale, et cetera. Um, Phil Mocken also points out last while, isn't a problem opening central bank accounts to non-bank users doesn't need CBDCs. Well, I think we know that, don't we? Uh, Bank of England has opened up to, to non-banks as well without having a CBDC. Now, to, to wrap us up, um, I'd like to go back to, to where we began, which is that there is a problem here. Uh, whatever we think, you know, the G20 and the, and the United Nations and the CPMI have identified cross-border payment costs. And I hear what you said, Vikesh, about 40% um, being there, you know, within five minutes. That still means, I don't know, let's say half of them are still not reaching their destination, you know, within 24 hours. The costs uh, which are being measured by these various official bodies, up to 10% of the cost of a payment. The average cost of a remittance, I said 6.82%, uh, which has prompted the UN to say, well, let's cut that to three. Um, and yet we've got this, despite all the talk of protectionism in the world, as you yourself have pointed out, very articulately, Vikesh, there is a, you know, people are doing real business. There is international trade and, and commerce going on as well as, as well as financial flows. So actually the, the, the value of the payments industry is likely to, to increase. Now, now, I'll start with you, Vikesh. Who, if you look, I don't know, five or 10 years ahead, um, and you're not allowed to say swift in answer to this, um, who do you think should be the, the major beneficiary of the growth and transformation of, of the payments industry? Who would you expect to succeed in this? And I mean, I'm, I'm talking at a very high level. Will it be infrastructures? Will it be banks? Will it be fintechs? Or dare I say it, will it be consumers and corporates and, and governments? Where will, the, where will this value created by transformation, digital and otherwise, in this industry, who will be the major beneficiaries of that? So I think um, my, what I would say is um, I'm yet to see anyone wake up and say, I want to make a payment, right? It's just not the way the world works, right? Um, payments are there, whether it's remittance, remittances to serve a purpose, corporate payments, SME payments, all facilitating some activity, right? I don't wake up and go, hey, I just want to send a pound just for the sake of sending a pound, right? So ultimately, the user experience for corporates, for SMEs, for, for those participating in the ecosystem, I think has got to be driving what then evolves, right? And, you know, Removing those frictions, I think, is a key part. And I know you said, you know, I shouldn't answer like this. I think we have a role to play in that and a long-term role to play in that. And, you know, one point, just um, as you mentioned, we do see and have data that says nearly 100% of cross-border payments are credited within 24 hours. And those that aren't are for a combination of some of the reasons I set out earlier. Uh, Vikash, before you go, just data is obviously part of the problem here. You know, SWIFT has got this program yeah. to transfer the payments industry to ISO 2082. It remains to be seen whether all the banks yes. transition to that. But what's just in, in, in general terms, how important is data in solving this 
this problem standardized data is getting rid of all these different message types and message protocols and enabling people to exchange data seamlessly i mean i would expect you to say yes it's a big part of the solution but are standards part of the solution or are there other ways of enabling data to be exchanged seamlessly yeah no, i think structured highly structured data is, is critical right and it's not necessarily how you construct that data it's the data dictionary that sits behind it you know it's the it's the understanding that something as represented in a certain way does a certain thing and we at swift have been trying to provide solutions to that for well over 40 years and if you do get into a world where you have highly structured resilient data that you can then get into the new types of business insights, new business models. You can get into a lot of value creation in terms of customer experience um, and also remove some of the frictions that are there. Right? You know, the interoperability challenge is a, is a persistent one and one that does need to be kind of solved. Mm -hmm. Stephen, what's your, if you look, looking ahead, um, who deserves to be, the winners from the value created by transformation within the cross-border payments industry? Who deserves to be um, versus who will be? Uh, that's a good question, Dominic. Um, well, the people who deserve to be. That's a good answer. Are, you can distinguish between them. <laughs> yeah. No, and, there is a, and there is a big difference. I mean, you know, right now, who's winning? You might argue who's winning out of the current scenario could be private equity. Firms, you know, to your point about fintech, there's a lot mm -hmm. of disruption, but not a lot of. There's no path to profitability for many of those firms, mm -hmm. um, and that and that is a problem, I think, on a on a long run basis. Mm -hmm. um, I think that who should win? It should be, you know, the person in the street. It should be, you know, me when I want to send money somewhere. It should be done at a price point that is that is clear obvious what i'm paying for it should lead to you know known you know when i'm buying something it should be from a particular merchant or a particular organization it should be clear what's wrapped into that cost my cost should be lower for for, for the things that i buy going forward and for the services that i consume so that is that's very much my point and you know coming right the way back to the very beginning you know, we framed all of this in a remittance story, and yet we spent all of our time talking about wholesale. It's yeah. expensive to be poor, right? And I think that, um, you know, remittances play, play a fundamental role in 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 a, in a certain sector of society. And, and, and in that sense, we've got to find better answers to be able to push more value back to the people who are receiving the, ben the benefit of those remittance funds. Thanks, Stephen. Danny, what, what's your what's your view about who the deserving and undeserving winners are likely to be? We, of course, hope the winners will be include Finality International, but uh, uh, we'd like a broader view from you. I mean, what's interesting is that payments are really a hot topic now. Right? If you go back 20, 20 years, <clears throat> it was not really an interesting topic, I think, commercially and and that central banks and this has changed right now the question is who will win who will provide the services i do think the incumbents are at risk of falling behind the wheel there are uh, big tech companies out there that provide new solutions there's uh, finality there are the central banks that now get into fields where they have not been before so i think it will be interesting and i don't know who who will mm -hmm. win, right? But but I think the incumbents are really at risk. Mm -hmm. By which you mean banks? Banks, it can uh, maybe maybe Swift. Who knows? Mm -hmm. so it could be infrastructure. Could be infrastructure, could be infrastructures as well. Okay. Infrastructures as well. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we're in an interesting in an interesting era. Um, uh, Arjun, um, yeah. what, what, my view. Uh, you're helping to create this future. What what what's your view? Sure. I mean, if my, my view is that, look, if you if you believe that the world is going to a completely uh, decentralized world where your, your economies are opening up, economies are growing, trade is growing on an international level, then you need payments. You need what's going to power all of this is payments. So if you believe that that's the world that it is, then you need you need payments to be in a, to be available in order for that to happen. I almost think it in, in another way. If you enable payments, your trade will grow. Look at the world pre-CLS and before CLS. Look, we may not, we may hate CLS, but give them credit for what they did. After CLS and before CLS, 
the volume of FX went 10x, 10x. Mm -hmm. You know, if you enable a better trade infrastructure for doing payments, trade will grow. So I believe that when trade grows, everybody in the ecosystem will benefit. The banks will benefit, the infrastructure providers will benefit, the fintechs will benefit, and eventually the, the users will benefit as well. Mm -hmm. But my take on this is you cannot solve the problem. I know it sounds really, really good. It feels good for everybody to solve the problem for the little guy, to stick it, to stand up for the little guy. But my fundamentally believe that you cannot solve the problem for the little guy who wants to pay from his phone until you solve, solve these market structure problems. So who's going to get taken out? I believe centralized structures are going to go away. Centralized structures like exchanges, which you need to rely on, siloed things like the CLSs, which everybody pay me and I will pay out. Those kind of systems are going to go away. It's going to be decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer settlements, faster, transparent, on-demand. That's the world that I'm, I'm looking for. So everybody's going to win in that one. And when they win, trade is going to go up, everything's going to go up. That's my, my take. Okay. Thank you, Arjun. It's a very interesting take. Um, Daniel, a last word from you. Uh, you've heard Arjun say there that, that this payments isn't just an effect of, of international growing international prosperity. It might actually be a cause of it. And therefore, it is rightly the concern of the central banks of the world, the regulators of the world, the governments of the world to fix this thing. Is it going to be fixed in the next five years? I think uh, it, it's continuously being fixed, and I think there's more pressure on uh, there's more pressure now than ever to to uh, increase the pace at which it's being fixed. So so let's not pretend like we're moving we're we're starting from nothing. This is a the, this is we are on the trajectory, and you know maybe now it's intensifying a little bit more to Danny's comments. Payments didn't used to be cool and popular, and I think this is a sold out panel, and and here we are kind of debating uh, vigorously the topic. Um, uh, you know, maybe just a couple of, a couple of comments as we as we close up. You mentioned data. I think one thing that we didn't talk about here at all that I think everybody should pay closer attention to is big techs and big techs getting into the payment to, into the payment game. We talk about fintechs as if it's some small startup -y thing, you know, a couple of people in a garage. Big techs are getting into payments in a big way. Uh, and I think that's something that we should all be cognizant about. You mentioned DM or Libra, and that's kind of the first uh, serious attempt that, you know, woke everybody up. When we talk about data as well, I think it wouldn't be far-fetched to say that payment data is potentially some of our most coveted and important data. Uh, it has it links to digital identity. It can link to all kinds of things. And then I would expand the focal point of payment data to think about data at large. So think about big text, think about trust in data, and then think about what happens when your payment data is potentially exposed to the same market participants as well. So I would encourage a conversation about data that doesn't just include payment data, but includes a whole data economy and what happens when, uh, when, you know, if we look at just just to bring this example to life, when we look at buy now, pay later schemes as opposed to credit card schemes, you know, that's a lot about data. And it's about data at the point of sale and the difference between data at the point of sale versus the difference that the credit card companies have and what the credit actually is against. So the conversation about data is probably uh, necessitates another whole hour to, to discuss. You asked who will who will win, and I, I I think that's 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 a really interesting way of framing it. I think the pie for payment, the pie for payments will get smaller. There's there's no doubt that six point something percent will need to go down. Everybody knows that that has to happen. But the digital economy at large will be bigger. There will be more value-added services. There will be services that we are only starting to understand now. And I think your real question shouldn't be about who will get that pie. It should be about who will start adding those value-added services when digital payments can free more, can flow more freely, can have less friction, and can enable the digital economy that we live in today. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you particularly for that editorial lead on our next uh, next iteration of, of exploring payments. I think we must stop now. But before I do, I'd just like to, to explain to one of our, our, our panelists, Eugenia, that the, she's asking about an article to find out about CBDCs and problems. So I can refer you to the to the BIS website. There's lots of research on CBDCs, but I also make use myself of the Kiffmeister um, uh, blog. And both of those things are very useful for CBDCs. But with that, I think we must um, uh, draw a line under our discussion today. I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Daniel Eden from the BIS Innovation Lab, Arjun Jairam from Baton Systems, uh, Daniel Heller from Finality International, Stephen Granger from MasterCard, and Vikish Patel from SWIFT. Uh, thank you all very much. And thank you to our audience too for your, your comments and your questions. Our next webinar is coming up very soon. It's on Thursday, to be precise. That's the 30th of September. 
Uh, and at it, with the help of our friends at FinTech Wales, we're going to be asking a very futuristic question, which is what will a blockchain economy look like? And we listen to Daniel, I feel we ought to be asking what a data economy looks like. But uh, we'll try our best to be as up to date as we can. And I hope that as many as possible you will join us then. Mm -hmm.